try to do all three of our regular segments like kind of fast and then get to the I ponder. And the I ponder is it's kind of about uh, how do you know when maybe you should prepare to bug out? <laughs> hmm. And once you figure Interesting. that out. Yeah, and, and, and once you figure that out, uh, what, 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 should, what should maybe be your first move? And it's, it's actually going to surround a story about a bunch of folks in D.C. that appear to be buying up some uh, doomsday properties. And... <laughs> Are they the gilded canary in the co the proverbial coal mine? <laughs> I will say this. Uh, I am always, usually after, uh, when I spend a lot of my time in a day on Facebook, that's when I feel there's time to bug out. That's <laughs> usually, yeah. After, so, after sorry, you... not sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Facebook does tend to do that. I, I, the last few days I've been kind of, I've been on Facebook, but I've been kind of stepping back a bit, and I I try to work on on putting my nose in my work because when I put my nose in my work, that's like one of the surest ways to keep me off of feeling like I have to comment for every Facebook page or post where I see somebody that's wrong. Yeah, it's you know, it's better to it's better to put it. it's better to put your nose in your work than to put your nose in other people's stupidity. Yeah. Unless, of course, your work is other people's stupidity. And to a certain degree, my work kind of is. <laughs> I, yeah, well, my non-paying work kind of is. My paying work is not, but my non-paying work is, it's, it kind of is. It's, and hopefully someday it'll be paying work, at least partly paying work. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's better to keep busy and uh, keep off the Facebooks as as much as possible. And really, you you get a lot more. I would say I believe much much more productive things than. Yeah, I almost got sucked into a Facebook argument today, and I was like, you know, no, I'm not doing face it. Face beef, face beeferies. So so yeah, I I wrote articles instead. I wrote a whole bunch of articles. As a matter of fact. This is one of the articles we're going to start off with. Are, are, well, are you ready to start, or did you want to do the chit-chat routine a little bit longer? I, I guess we're ready to start. Yeah, are you I'm, ready to I'm start? Ready. I'm ready to start. So this is the this story is where we get the title for the show, which is Don't Tax Me, Bro. I'm a freaking robot. This is the real story, by the way, Lou. This is not an onion story. So this is a tax on robot labor could be in the works. Again, this is not an onion story, just so everybody is up to date on that. So in a bid to control the natural emergence of a new reality, central planners are already trying to figure out fair ways. That's the word they use, not my word. Do you like that word, fair, right? I prefer it when it comes to golfing. That's about the only <laughs> like time. fair way? <laughs> Fairway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fairways. Fairways to do what? <laughs> Fairways to tax robots for their labor. <laughs> so, since robots can't pay tax bills yet, the onus will fall on the robot owners. And since robot owners don't work, plan, invest, or design for free, the cost of that robot labor will be passed on to the person who is paying for the product or service the ro robot worker helped create. And and this was an article that was in mybiz.com. That's Michigan Business, I believe. That's your neck of the woods, right? It could be, yeah. Could, could be, theoretically. You know a little bit about Bear Skatchewans and all that? I know all about Bear Skatchewans. By the way, Bear Skatchewan figures at the end of the show. I don't know. Maybe it is Bear Scotch one. I'm not sure. You'll tell me when we get to it. I so will. The, the, this article will give you some ostensible reason to justify taxing robots, such as uh, one of the reasons they gave was they, they, they want to prevent robots from taking jobs from humans or, or taking as many jobs from humans. So the idea is to tax the robots, to raise the cost of the robots so that they're no longer the most 
efficient choice over humans. Like it'll still cost you less to pay a human. So. In many in many cases, it does already cost less to pay a human than it does a, to purchase robots. The, the only time that, that robots become a better value is when you take uh, particularly unskilled, unproductive labor and make it artificially more expensive through uh, silly nonsense uh, things like uh, minimum wage laws and, and, and just different stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess uh, I guess ironically it's the minimum ma- wage laws that, that kind of put robots at an advantage. <laughs> right, right. Right. I when, when when you when you make a robot more affordable, you can't be surprised when people go there. I as a matter of fact this this is the same nonsensical logic that is used with tariffs. Uh, you, you put a tariff on foreign goods coming in, and the argument is it will drive people to buy American goods. It didn't make the American goods any more affordable, competitive, or increase the quality. Not one bit. It just made the it just made the more affordable stuff less affordable. So like the affirmative action program that it is, it made the more competitive artificially less competitive. So the same thing happens when you when you start doing these minimum wage laws and, and requiring health insurance and, and all these different things. You, you make something artificially more expensive. Therefore, it becomes more affordable to go hiring robots. Right. So what you're saying pulling out my best Kathy Newman here. So what you're saying is the market manipulation created the problem and now you want to solve the problem with another with lobsters. market manipulation. Right? With lobsters. Right. <laughs> with lobsters. Is so, she the lobster lady? Yeah, that's the lobster lady. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, I mean, they imagine that they have the capacity as they're doing this, they have the capacity to predict all of the new opportunities that could be created if you simply allow robot labor to emerge the way the market will, will naturally find them useful or not. And maybe if you didn't manipulate the market, you wouldn't give the robots an advantage <laughs> that you're giving them now. Maybe solve that problem. Maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, so, uh, you know, w- within the boundaries of the only true identifier of an authentic market, which is the price, if you remove that, you you really don't know the bloody mess that you're going to cost by, by, by imagining that you're going to manipulate the market in a way that you're going to figure out the right balance. Like, how much robots is enough robots? How mm-hmm. much robots is not enough robots? Let's try to manipulate and we'll create a tax so that we could try to, yeah, yeah, you know, like to keep the robots at a certain level that we imagine is the right level. But you really don't know. You can't know. There's too many unknown factors. So <laughs> I, I don't know the bloody mess that they're, they're, they're going to create there. The, the, argu- the article is from mybiz.com. Are you looking at the article itself there? It's a, it's, it's a January 2018 study from the researchers of Northwestern University. Yeah, and here's here's the thing, um, and and I don't know if they're looking at this from a uh, Venus Project type of mindset to where uh, robots have, have started doing all the labor. That means humans can play all the time, and, and there's no need for them to work. They they send their robots to work for them. And the robots, the robots bring bring home the money, and being the good pimps that they are, the humans say, "Okay, here's your twenty percent." I like it. But here's here's the thing: if we're getting to the point that um, labor is being done by machines, and you do not need human involvement in the in the process of of labor, which is probably thousands and thousands of years away, but if, if we're getting to that point, don't you think we're at the point? that we no longer need government or taxation. Can't we just send our robots out to make my roads? Yeah, absolutely. We could send the robots. I don't know if they're going down the Venus Project path. I think they're actually trying to stop the Venus Project. They would rather 
they they would you know you're ruining hardworking jobs. They would rather see human beings work by the sweat of their brow. You know the old American work ethic. You know it's a good thing for human beings to work hard and break their bones and grind their bodies down and die at the age of sixty. That's the noble thing, Lou. And you're that's, ending that. Yeah, that's a that Puritan work ethic, right? That's that. That's absolutely that Puritan work work, work ethic. Uh, I really like if you you haven't heard Thaddeus Russell. I think you probably have a little Thaddeus Russell's take on the Puritan work ethic. He uh, he dissects that thing pretty good. And uh, what it really boils down to is why is it a noble thing to work hard? I understand yeah. the. Go ahead. I haven't heard it. I've heard about it, and. Uh, I, I guess uh, he was on the Tom Woods show, yeah. and he kind of he kind of lambasted Woods with that. And I haven't heard it. I, I really need to, though. You do. It's a beautiful thing. I I, I kind of thought it before he said it. I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. At, when I heard him, I was like, "Yeah, I've been bugged by this thing for a while." Like, yeah, he's right. This is more important than I thought. It's this 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 idea that somehow that if if my, my daughter was talking about having a good work ethic. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? If you could figure out a way. Now, I'm not advocating that you sponge off of others and that you steal from people and that you mooch off the land. But if you could figure out a way to work like an easy hour a day, an easy minute a day, whatever. If you could figure out a way and then have the rest of your time to do what the heck you want, your leisure, I got no issue with that. That's none. that that is really a good thing. But if you look at if you look at the history of humanity, uh, particularly before technological advances, and by technological advances I mean semi modern machinery and tools, you know, to to where you didn't need a to where you didn't need a uh, uh, tie a tie like a flat stone to a stick to use as a shovel. I mean, just being able to get a properly fashioned shovel uh let alone the the, the tractors and, and modern farm equipment i back in those days labor was was absolutely backbreaking and you went from sun up to sun down and, and there was no getting around it and and the quest of humanity has been for leisure time right so but it's in america it's this schizophrenic thing we want leisure time but we hold on to this puritan work ethic which i guess maybe you could say was useful at the time if you really needed if there was no way around it you really needed people to work back breaking hours or otherwise stuff didn't get done it was kind of good to have this work ethic that kind of gave them a sense of moral superiority uh, about grinding their bodies down to dust in a much shorter period of time but now they don't need to so why hold on to that work ethic uh tradition right See, well, the thing is, the, the, the Puritan work ethic is something that you would get primarily out of conservatives. And the, how could I put it? Hmm. In, a, in a kinder, gentler way, or are you just going to let it Yeah. Con conservatives, <laughs> the, the, the history of conservatism hasn't been about small government freedom or any of that or crap that, that a handful of them will proclaim. Uh, conservatism has basically been to ensure that nothing ever changes. Uh, the, the early conservatives in America were the British loyalists, the Tories, and, and they didn't want to switch over from uh, being under the king to being under their own self-rule because they, they admired the tradition of royalty and everything else. And it's always this appeal to, to, to tradition with the rationalization of, oh, but it's tried and true. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but – the, the the resistance to new ideas is just such an intellectual Ludditeism that it's it it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's how, how it's goofy terrible. it is. It's, so you it's you have not you have, effective anymore. It doesn't serve a, a a real purpose. It's I'm gonna say it's anti human at this point. Yeah. So what you have is in the past it it was necessary to work hard and it was considered honorable to work hard and engage in long hours, backbreaking labor. And the person who worked one hour a day was considered to be a shammer. But if you're, if you're actually capable of being productive in one hour instead of eight hours, then 
you have to be a lunatic to keep going with it. But because of that appeal to tradition, you know, that's where they stay. Yeah, I, 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 I envision the conservatives 80 years from now, there's going to be a push to say, you know what? Maybe marriage really is only between a man and a woman. And the conservatives will be like, no, no, no. It's it's gay marriage. It's 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 three people marrying. That's the tradition. <laughs> well, well, also conservatives they they the right wingers in general have a greater fondness to obedience than they have for freedom. So what they will say, look, it's a tradition that government manages our health care. Okay, we have a process here. You fill out your paperwork. You wait your turn. You don't jump in front of line. Obamacare is the law of the land. Uh, no going out and getting undocumented health care either because it's unfair to those who waited their turn. Well, yeah, it's it's about law and order. This is I've said in a few shows recently, you know, my one of my biggest frustrations is, you know, with this gun push that's going on, the quote unquote allies in the fight to hold on to your guns are the conservatives. But the conservatives worship the very agents that make all of the bobbleheaded screeches have any power to them. The police, the military, yeah. the police. Yeah. <laughs> so, they, they say things like when Nancy Pelosi comes for our guns, A-R-E, our police, A-R-E, <laughs> are going to arrest her. And throw her in jail. And then what was the meme that I made the other day? It's from the inception. Um, you know how Facebook has this new facial recognition thing going on? No. Uh, apparently, all right, well, what, what they're You're supposed creeping. to do is they're, 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 they're supposed to find photos that are of you or maybe of you. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and they this, report yes. them to you. Well, apparently, I am Karen Hins from Inception. That makes sense. So do you know how many notifications I get each day of somebody who shared a Inception meme, the him with Leonardo DiCaprio and Leo, and the and the final thing, Leonardo DiCaprio is just staring at him like, why did you say something that shot me down? And uh, so anyway, uh, the interesting thing is I get I get a large selection of those Inception memes, but uh, the, the one that I most recently made is, uh, DiCaprio saying, you know, our police aren't going to come take our guns. Unlike cannabis, gun ownership is legal. And then Karen Hens asks, well, what if, what if gun ownership is made illegal like cannabis? And DiCaprio is just like, huh? <laughs> right. Because, yeah, you know, th th those are the natural allies. Good, good. You really feel like you got an army behind you. You, you look behind you and, and they're, you know, when when the when the police come to confiscate your guns, and you've been you know talking with your conservative friends, you're gonna blah leave. When the police come, you're gonna look behind you. You're gonna see them all in their houses with their little thin blue line flags on the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th they won't be able to fight the second American Revolution because all their battle flags will have thin blue lines through them. Right, and I think you've made that joke. That meme too before the thin red many line. times. It's, yes, it's it's an easy one to make. We're gonna go. We're gonna take you. This was the shorter leash. Now we're gonna we're gonna take a step beyond. Okay, everybody. I want you to be of good cheer. I want you to be a little excited. I'm not gonna play the bump. I don't feel like it. We're just gonna go to it. We're going. We're going to the longer leash. And if you can see the visual, if you're listening on audio, you're missing the visual. Longer leash. That's the bump right there. That's the new bump. <laughs> bump, bump, <laughs> bump, 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 it, bump, bump. If, if you see the, the visuals, what you'll see is you'll see Lou and I, and we're outside of a gate, a fence, and behind the fence is the American flag. That's your longer leash right there. I thought that that symbolizes what we're talking about here. So this you can story, trample my freedom all day long. You just better not burn the symbol of my freedom. Oh, uh, I love that one is uh stomp my flag and I'll stomp your ass. Oh, oh, oh the the, the gay guy with the rainbow yeah. flag? Yeah. Yeah, it says it says uh disrespect <laughs> my flag, I'll pound your ass. Yeah. Always or, a, always a classic. <laughs> it's it's a winner. So this is uh this is about civil asset forfeiture. And this is about Wyoming. 
You know some people that live in Wyoming, I think. Both of uh, them. Oh, you know both both of the Wyoming <laughs> residents. Yeah. <laughs> so a Wyoming bill banning civil asset forfeiture waivers passes the legislature. This is But to be sure it doesn't it doesn't ban civil asset forfeiture. No. Well, it it does kind of put a crimp on it. It's uh, as I wrote so adeptly and skillfully because I can objectively judge my own writing. Our our Wyoming masters are are working on extending our leash a bit, passing a bill recently that would al- not allow cops to intimidate people to sign a waiver that would give the state their assets during an investigation. So. What the cops were doing was they were using intimidation to get them to sign a waiver, so it made them a little bit easier for them to do the civil asset forfeiture. Wait a minute. Why Why would our police use intimidation? Aren't they the good guys? They wouldn't have called it intimidation. They would have called it strong suggestions. Helpful okay. strong su- suggestions. So Liberty in other words, so in other words, th- this doesn't strike at the root. This kind of like kicks at a at a at a leaf that had fallen off in the strong wind and this basically this basically puts a restraint on the cops somewhere around the the strength of uh, I don't know the constitution yeah something like that it's it's like like the 4th 5th or 6th amendment somewhere something like that but anyway see, see what i think is when they had the waiver and people signed the waiver, then the, the Wyomingans, when they saw there was a civil asset forfeiture case, they were like, yeah, well, he, well, he signed a waiver. Now, now if they do a civil asset forfeiture of somebody that the Wyomingans like. Now, don't get me wrong. If they do a civil asset forfeiture of an undesirable, pick your category, you're not going to hear a squeak. But just, you know, just let's pretend that they they do a civil asset forfeiture thingy on, on, on someone that Wyomingans like. Then... Uh, without this waiver in place, they're going to get really mad and and say mean things for like uh, days. That's that's what this will do. Oh well, heck, I I had no idea it was so strong. <laughs> right, it, it'll it increase sound, it'll increase, increase the length of time that the Wyomingans get on their Wyoming blogs and talk to their three people in Wyoming and about how it mad sounds they airtight. Are. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the details are Wyoming becomes just just the third state, okay? Just the third state. Just, you know, 50 states. You do the math there. Uh, to ban the forms, which critics say allow the state to avoid protections against civil asset forfeiture, a process that allows law enforcement to take people's property if they are implicated in a drug crime. By the way, implicated in a drug crime is, hey, you have more than 100 bucks of cash on you. That's an implication. That's an implication. <laughs> you know, somebody needs to do those memes. I, I don't know the full vision, but it's got to be something, you know, like that, that's a paddling. It's got to be like, that's an implication. That's an implication. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so... Uh, the the Wyoming Tribune Eagle reported this. The bill was sponsored by Democratic State Representative Charles Pelkey and other lawmakers. Hey, thank you, Pelkey. That's a little golf clap for Pelkey. He was inspired to push for the change by the story of Phil Parhamov, Parhamovich, probably a desirable, somebody that people in Wyoming would like. Uh, last year on his way to Wisconsin with nearly $92,000 hidden in a speaker in the back of his man van. Uh, Parhanovich planned to use the money to buy a music studio in Madison, Wisconsin, formerly used by two grunge bands, Nirvana and the Smashing Pumpkins. So he was probably of one of the approved groups of people that would make you upset that there was a civil asset forfeiture. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so now this bill will not give the cops that that layer of of politeness and civility that they once had when they could strongly suggest to you that you that you sign this waiver and uh, forfeit all of your property. Otherwise, it could be really bad for you. You know, you could go away for a really long time, or you could sign this waiver. <laughs> 
That's kind of how it works, folks. And when they say you can go away for a really long time, what they mean is we will kidnap you and we will throw you in a cage. That's the that's yep. the non-gov. That's the degoved version of 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 what we're talking about. Uh, Jacob uh, Labelle says, uh, "Sounds like a Serb." I don't know. Oh, Brett, Brett Dolinger. Hey, Brett, how you doing? Brett has uh, has uh, has something for you. Are you ready, Lou? Yes, I am. No, I'm not getting tattoos. Lou needs some tattoos. You need one of them Michael Tyson, Mike Tyson tattoos on your face. You Thank know? you for that suggestion. Uh, I will take it under n- no advisement. No, no advisement. I don't know where Larry is, Jacob. I'm disappointed that Larry hasn't shown up and done some of his. Man, he had some golden opportunities to to do some screeching there. We're gonna we're gonna get to off the leash already. Are you ready, dude? We're. Doing I am this. so ready. I've been we're on the leash this. all day. Well, okay. This is. Uh, uh, did you hear about this story? Now, this story, you might wonder why this is off the leash. Philly soda tax. Hi, Jacob. Leads. We're not ignoring you. We're just paying attention to other things. Jacob, no. I'm, I'm not ignoring you. I'm not ignoring you, man. No, I did. I said, sounds like a Serb. I didn't get that. Tell me what sounds like a Serb. Okay, Larry's been here. Larry's just not been responding. That's amazing. That's amaze balls. Larry actually listened to a show without feeling the need to to say some horrible Stady Von Stay Face thing. Uh, by the way, Lou, I don't know if you know this, but I have kind of deemed Larry the official villain of his daily. It's good for the show. Yes, you've referred to him as an absolutely horrible human being. Worst human being. Worst human yeah, the being. Wor- the worst human being. I I was kind of trying to soft pedal it a little bit. No, but... no, worst human being. Hi, Martha. Being. Martha. I by the way, Martha. Martha Wilson. Martha is the machine. Uh, she used to work uh, for me uh, way back in the day. Do you remember those days? Those are the good old days, Martha. Cross publishing. Yeah, those were the days. Remember those days, Martha? Those are good times. And uh, John Smith is here. John says, "Keep up the good work, Larry." He is. He is doing it. There's a lot of really horrible human beings out there, though. Uh, they look up to Larry like, thank God there's Larry, because at least I'm not the worst human being. Uh, okay. Philly soda tax leads to creation of black market. Have you heard of this story? Uh, vaguely, and I love it already. It's It's a wonderful story. So sometimes we who dare dream of alternative governance to the course of enterprise model... We like to speculate as to whether it's a good or bad thing when the state passes a new round of uh, more controlling laws aimed at the market. Because I know it, it, it might seem like, why would you be for the state passing laws that are more restricting? This is one of the reasons. <laughs> so Philly, in all of their wisdom, decided, you know what, uh, people are fight, and uh, I think it's because of soda uh, we should uh, we should try to control how they live their lives so that they're not fat. Plus, it's a source of revenue, so it's a win win. So, no, it's not because no, no, in order, mind. yeah. Well, here's the thing about sin taxes like this: uh, if you're trying to reduce bad behavior and you're also trying to increase revenue then one of those is guaranteed to fail, if not both. Because if in in order to get in order to get more money, people have to keep drinking the soda. So the tax has to be ineffective. Uh, in order to get people to reduce their soda intake, then you have to uh, forego getting the tax money. So you're not going to get both. Uh, what's most likely going to happen, and which I suspect is the direction that you're heading into, is, as Murray Rothbard pointed out, sin taxes do not reduce bad behavior or increase revenue. They simply encourage smuggling. And let me yeah, also add in that. alternative markets. So I call them, I you, they call them black markets. I'm taking to call them liberty markets. They're freaking liberty yeah. markets. That's what I'm referring to them yeah. as. Or alter, alternative methods, I should say. Because back when I used to be a smoker, I used to, I used to be able to smoke cigarettes for about a dollar a pack. And that was because I would go buy 
the tobacco that was labeled as pipe tobacco. And there, there's some that was actually legitimately pipe tobacco. And then there's stuff that was labeled as pipe tobacco for tax purposes because pipe tobacco has a very low uh, tax rate in most places, much lower than cigarette tobacco. And so I'd buy a box of the tubes and there was an injector and I could put, I could put tobacco in the chamber, give the, give the thing up, give the machine a crank and it would shoot the tobacco into the tube. And and quite frankly, it was often difficult to tell the difference between one of these homemade cigarettes and the ones that you buy at the store, except for I was saving about $5 per pack because I wasn't paying all the taxes. So that right there is an example of an alternative alternative method yes uh, but you did that 30 years ago way past the uh, everything uh, yes whatever. yes right uh, way, way way past the statue of liberty i mean statute of limitations <laughs> right uh, jacob labelle says uh please do i'm just angry i'm good with you guys i've experienced a personal tragedy as it pertains to international trade well that's interesting oh well, you you should elaborate on that and uh here comes Larry Cousins. This is the Larry that I love. This is I love this guy. Jacob, tell us your story. There's half a chance it'll be better than this show. <laughs> that is a good one, Larry. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Uh, die, Larry. Die. Could uh, you yeah, just Bodie's get the overdose here. out of the Bodie? way? Go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I was just asking Larry if he could get his overdose out of the way. Yes. Side note, Lou is correct now. Now back to Jacob. I, I'm actually going to go back to the Philly story. So that's how I roll. That so, works too. So it's it, it again. It it's it seems contradictory, but sometimes when when people pass laws like this, they it's a good thing because something happens on the way to that perfect win-win fantasy. And I know I know you said. You know, you used logic and reason and showed how syntax is impractical. These folks, Lou, they're thinking very short term. They're not thinking. They're thinking like next year's revenue. That's about as far as they're thinking. So Dare I mind, say they're, they're not even thinking. Year. What's that? Dare I say that they're not even thinking. I would have to say that they're more on autopilot than than thinking. Dude, how can we get money? We're short again. Oh, we could cut the budget. Cut the budget? Are you kidding me? No, man. Oh, how can we how can we how can we raise taxes in a way that it looks like we're doing it because we like them and, we're, and we care about them and we're benevolent rulers? I know soda tax, but something happened on the way to that that perfect fantasy of theirs. Reality smacked the new Puritan square in the mouth in the form of the Liberty Market. So what what seems to have happened, as you could easily predict, Lou, is that. People don't want to pay the extra price for the soda. So two things are happening. One, people are just buying their soda outside of Philly, which isn't terribly hard. But the other thing that's happening is people are going outside of Philly and buying a lot of soda and bringing it in and selling it to people with a slight markup. But still, they're not paying nearly the, the cost of the of the Yay! They, they're, is, is it like the ice cream truck where people ha have like their F-150 or, or uh, Toyota Tundra and they're driving around, they got the music and, and people can just go running up to the pickup truck or the windowless van and say, I would, I would like a six pack of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's happening is they're buying them. These sodas in bulks, and they're actually selling them to the stores, and the stores are kind of selling them on the down low, dude. That's what's happening. And oh, so, that's even better. So there are soda smugglers. Soda smugglers exist. I love uh, that soda smugglers exist. I did this uh, on headlines you may have missed. I did this. I I talked about the story in, in a little bit, but I speculate. I was wondering. You know the Kennedys were were born from from the Rum Runner days, the, the when the you know the alcohol prohibition days. I just wonder what new royal uh, political family will be born from the great sm soda smuggling empire that will be built thanks to the morons of Philadelphia. Although I might be a bit hyperbolic in that. Now. Now there's a twist. I to think this story. I th I think I think your choice of language was completely measured and reasonable. Thank you. 
<laughs> now there is a twist to this story. So uh, let me let me get to the here. This is this is from uh, Jacob. Jake, Jacob says death penalty for smug, soda smugglers. Now, wait till you find out that the CIA is smuggling soda into Philadelphia. Whoa! Ah, uh, I gotta make a YouTube <laughs> video about that. Wait! Wait till you see that the troops are guarding soda fields in <laughs> in, in Harrisburg. Uh, in Harrisburg. <laughs> in Harrisburg or uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Let's just Iraq. Mount Pocono. Mount Pocono. Yes, Mount Pocono. That that yeah. would be. Yes, in the Pocono fields. <laughs> in yeah. the great Pocono soda fields. So I'm I'm I want I want to get to. This is Danny Price, the the secretary treasurer of Teamsters Local 830. And they represent soda bottlers and delivery drivers. So this is what he says. Lou, please try to contain yourself. This might trigger you. People are going out of Philadelphia to Delaware, New Jersey, and the surrounding counties, and they're bringing back soda. I mean, just how silly that <laughs> sounds. Oh my gosh! Right. Oh no! He, he, he's he's actually being interviewed by Reason. Okay, Le Reason is an ostensible libertarian site. I did say ostensible, Lou, because I know you love Reason. Uh, P P Price tells Reason, adding that he and his union's members spot vans loaded with soda coming into the city every day. The soda is then sold to local businesses looking to skirt the city's tax. This is a beautiful thing. I love this. This is this these folks are learning at 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 the very uh ground useful level uh how useless the state truly is. <laughs> I mean you 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 can't teach people how impractical the state is. Uh, with words, quite like you can with these guys, the gals. Maybe there's gals. I'm not. I don't want to say there's not gals soda smugglers. Man, I hope there are, dude. I see a TV series in this. I see like a a a, a rebel gal soda smuggler. Uh, come on, <laughs> going to Jersey. You know, yo man, you got this. Yeah, yeah. You know what her name's gonna be? Daisy Do. Daisy Do. Oh, I love it. Daisy Do. Soda smugglers. Mondays at five or Mondays at nine. <laughs> so so the result says price is less money for the city and Breaking less soda. work for his union members. He's talking to Reason Magazine. Does he not know who Reason Magazine is? Air delivery drivers bid on an area, and that's their area. People are buying on the, I'm going to say, Liberty Market. Our guys lose. Now, here you have a situation, Lou, where some some jackbooted morons thought that it was a cool thing to create some artificial, uh, I don't know, heist? I don't know what you call it. I don't want to call it a tax, but whatever you want to call it. They created this artificial cost. For the purpose of, of raising mm -hmm. immediate revenue for their own for it, their own it's an it's an excise theft of sorts. Yeah, whatever it is. They they're they're raising revenue for their own personal profit as well as to well, have here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh with, with this uh num nugget that says that his guys are gonna lose, our guys lose. Uh, they're they're not losing because People are buying on the black market. They're losing because the cost has been raised. So why not put blame where it belongs on the politicians that have created a minimum wage for fizzy beverages? This is our concern, dude. <laughs> yeah, that was a great Lebowski reference. How to work it in. Yeah, absolutely. This is our concern, dude. Right. Why? This is where I was going with this. Why the heck aren't you going after the guys that actually created this problem in the first place it, what what kind of jackbooted thugs are you that you're going along with this crap yeah yeah you've got uh you've got yourself a jelly spine or you're you're in for the take probably well, I mean, that's the latter case i mean, here's a thought though i look let's let's just say that this stuff that uh, that uh, taxes actually decrease bad behavior, or let me rephrase, uh, undesirable behavior, because 
you're not a bad person because you drink soda. You're unhealthy, but you're you're not a bad person. So let's let, so let's say that people quit just quit buying soda. They didn't buy it from the black market, but they quit buying it and started being healthy uh, because of this increased tax. Uh, would, would this guy still be complaining about the about the lost work for his people? Yes. No. Okay. So so no, if wouldn't. if yeah, I'm I'm sure he would because he's more concerned about his people working than, than he is about people being healthy. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what, so what would happen is then he would have to say the, the government's putting us out of business, but being that he's a union guy, he's probably very pro government and probably, probably leans a little bit more Democrat than, uh, than Republican, even though the two parties are rather interchangeable in many ways these days. But, uh, so I, yeah, it's, yeah, it, he, he's just a tool. Well, uh, he's he's part of the system is is what he's really showing here, and uh, I'm I, I got nothing against unions per se, but unions that rely on state coercion for their power, yeah, definitely have something against them. And I believe the I would I would I would like the employer to be able to determine whether a union is going to be in in his shop or not. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I kind of think that if people want to form an association and try to negotiate with the uh, owner, that that's their business. They can do that. Okay, and, and if the owner says, "I don't want a union in here," then what? Well, then the owner can fire everyone, and if he lives in a reality where most people want to be part of an association like a union, the owner's probably going to go out of business. If well, the, not, the thing the owner will the, stay in business. Yeah, because I mean, the thing is, most people uh, uh, th- these days, people that own a business, if if a union comes in there and the union gets a foothold, uh, the the business owner doesn't have a say in the matter. They can't say no. I'm well, not going to deal with the union. That's the state part. That's yeah. where the state yeah. is coercing the union on them. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, because. Yeah. Because one of my big problems with unions is they don't create anything. They they don't build a business. They they're they're parasites. Uh, so it kind of explains why they're why they get along so well with government. They don't build a business. They go in there and they siphon off of it. And if if uh, if a union came out and and started a business like let's let, let's say the UAW took uh, whatever membership that they wanted to that wanted to leave the the big three or any other car companies their their union and they secured their own private financing and opened up a car company under the under the union model now I'm, I'm curious to see how that would turn out I think it would either go bankrupt in the first year or all of a sudden they quit being dirty commies and and em, embrace uh, a little bit of capitalism I think that unions will exist in in Anarchistan <clears throat> not in their present form and not with their current focus but I don't know um, I did get a comment from the Liberty Principal Facebook page I suspect I know the individual behind the comment says a soda tax would destroy Bodhi right now. <laughs> yes. You and you and me too. Me you and me you you me me too. <laughs> Hashtag me that. too. Hashtag me too. <laughs> yeah. I I had a soda a couple nights ago. I actually I don't I drink I probably drink about four or five sodas a week. <clears throat> I used to drink a lot more, but the ones that I drink, I really enjoy. I really love my my sodas. I Just bought a four regularly. pack. I bought a four pack of black cherry soda from uh, Stewart's. They use the the cane sugar instead of the high fructose corn syrup. Uh, it, it's still crap. It's still unhealthy, uh, but is I think slightly less unhealthy than the regular death stuff was. Uh, which is not saying a whole lot. It's like being the taller, tallest midget in the circus. But anyway, uh, I, I had one of those and I mixed in some bourbon with it. So I had I had bourbon and soda. Yeah. Well, that warms the cockles of my heart. Let's get to the I ponder part, which uh, we did get to, even though it's really got so like we, 10, we will stay minutes or so. But we will st- we will stay until the pondering is done. Oh, or was that an order? Are you threatening me? Are you? No, don't tell me what to I'm just, do. I'm just suggesting. You're triggering my anarchies now. They just like you know. I have like 
op- oppositional defiance disorder. I I am just stating my commitment to making is daily Thursday <laughs> the dog pound the best the show possible. Pound? That's that's, the that's dog one of the pound, working titles. Dog Next week yeah. is going to be the last time it's called Is Daily Thursday. And then we're taking a week off. And then when we come back, it's going to be Is Daily Something. We don't know yet. If you have any suggestions, let us know. I, I said Is Daily's the leash. But Lou doesn't like that. So we'll have to keep thinking. So, pondering. Uh, there's a story about uh, these... Uh, Washington elites that have been buying up lots in something called Fortitude Ranch. So it's a a building of networks of backwoods doomsday camps around the country. And it's pulling in members, apparently, from affluent areas and even Washington national security officials. So this is the pondering question. When do you, what, what signs do you look for that you see and you're like, you know what? Mm, now is the time. Generally spending more than an hour straight on Facebook makes me want to bug out. But that's not a scientific thing. That's no. just, uh, you want to bug if, out if, from the if, planet. That's a, that's a you, humanity if, sucks thing. If you throw my anecdotes, anecdotal evidence in there, it's very scientific. Okay. It's completely well, scientific. So basically, if you get on Facebook and you spend more than an hour, you will determine and you will you will figure out pretty pretty quickly that human beings they're horrible human beings and uh, therefore you should try to get somewhere as far away from human beings as possible. Is that what you're saying? Uh, pretty much. No, I mean, as, as far as bugging out, the, the, the nice thing about living up here in Bear Saskatchewan is I, I already have bugged out, sort of. <laughs> it, it, it's a very low population up here. It's very rural. So the, the hunting and fishing would be better. But, uh, hmm. You I don't know. know. That, takes me, that takes me to something. Uh, so, so this is kind of related it is. It absolutely is. Right. It's very related. I'm, I'm actually excited about this because, uh, as you know, I, I had a guest stop by last Friday. Uh, Scott Bowers was in town, and he's from North or South, South Carolina. Yes. The Bowers came over for dinner last Friday night, and we got a chance to meet in person for the first time and, and do some yakking. And very interesting guy. I, I really enjoyed it. But anyway, I go ahead and lead in, and I'll just jump in. Five ideal off-the-grid homesteading destinations in North America. I want, to, I want to talk about the first one that they give here. Uh, so if you're thinking of going off-grid and developing your own homestead, uh, you can't just go anywhere. Like, like you can't go to New Orleans and try to homestead. That would be stupid. So they list five places in North America recommended, and they is uh, a site called Blue and Green Tomorrow. And the first one they list, and tell me if you know anything about this, it is the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan. Keweenaw. Keweenaw. What do you know about that place? That is, and I'm pretty sure on this, that is the horn of uh, of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That's where Houghton and Hancock, Copper Harbor, uh, stuff like that is. So, Am I right? Did I win a prize? Yeah. 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 Hold on. Here it comes. Yay. Paul gave me the clap. <laughs> I did. It's not the first time I gave you the clap, and it won't be the last. Okay. Wow. You're not going to sleep tonight, are you? <laughs> uh, I have muscle relaxers, so yes, I will. Oh, you. Oh, that's good. Oh, good. He has muscle relaxers. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing myself in the role. So what they say about it? It's a remote spit of land jutting out into Lake Superior, about as far from Michigan's big cities as it is as it's possible to get without leaving the state. Folks up here are self-reliant by necessity. Many are entirely self-sufficient with a hoop house, a chicken coop, 
and an ice fishing hut, you can get around the short growing season easily, known as Copper Country. Do you know this Copper Country? Yes, I do. Uh, the the I, I've been up there. I was uh, not all the way up there, but I, I was pretty close to the tip. I would I went to Michigan Tech for a hockey camp back in the eighties. So you were that's a hockey guy. Yeah. Wow. Jacob says it's Uber territory, and Martha says, "Yay, cloud!" I remember Martha. That's an inside joke. But anyway. So, but anyway, uh Was it? Oh well. Anyway, yeah. Uh, the the Lou yeah the hockey the, skates. The, the the thing about that area is the winters up there are extremely fierce, so you can expect lots and lots and lots of snow in the winter time up there. Uh, they get clobbered. They 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 don't get like a quarter inch. They they get a quarter inch in like July. Okay. In in December, January, February, it's six inches, twelve inches, eighteen inches. I mean, they just get absolutely clobbered. It's cold. It's right on Lake Superior, so it's not the most hospitable territory. But it's that's actually an attraction. If it's not hospitable, it's not highly desirable, and therefore a lot a, a lot less people will leave you alone. And Jacob says he's Minnesotan. I apologize. I'm sorry for your loss, Jacob. Uh, anyway, I think you can get over that though, Jacob. Jacob, bit. do you go to Agora Fest? Jacob, do you go to Agora Fest? And uh, oh, oh, what isn't there something coming up in Michigan soon? Yes, the sixth annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest will be held at the Circle Pine Center June twenty first through June twenty fifth this year, twenty eighteen. Scheduled speakers include Scott Horton, Brett Vinat. Prof. CJ, Dana Martin, Luis Fernando Mises, and I can't remember who else was on there. And negotiations are are underway, underway with uh, Name Redacted. Me. Uh, they haven't offered me enough money yet. Still in negotiations. I'm sure they'll come through, though. It's going to be going to be a lot of money. Oh, like 50, I know. Nick, Nick Hazelton. Nick Hazelton will be there. Oh, the Yak Man will be there. I'm like 50-50 that I'll be there. I'm working on it. I have to I have to secure a couple more contracts to have the money to go. That's what I'm working on. So back to the original question, which, you know, we just kind of introduced, you know, once you determine that it's time to bug out, you can't just go anywhere. Michigan's just one of the places. What, 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 seriously, what would be the signs that you would look at and you say, you know what, I know homesteading out there in places where it might be a little rough. I, I know, I know the quality of life that I'm used to, you know, subjectively that it won't be as great, but uh, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to really work on getting that homestead set up and, 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 and beat a path out of here. What would be the signs that you would look for? I really, I don't have a list of things that make me, that that would make me say, all right, I'm out of here. I got to go. I'm bugging out. I, I just don't have anything that solid. Yeah, I don't either. I was kind of hoping that you did and you'd, you'd come through and like, okay, that makes, that makes, Larry, stay home. You'd be better off. Um, Larry, if if something happened like suddenly, Larry, I think you're right. Hunker down. I agree. Hunker down. Wait till things calm down and then figure out that you can work your way to a better place. But I'm talking about you see it telegraphed and you're like, yeah, I know stuff's going to go down. Now it's it's time to, to head out onto uh, homestead land. And, uh, and uh, John Smith says you were better there, Paul. Uh, he's talking about the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest. I was there last year. And Pride Cabin. We were in the Pride Cabin, and it was a beautiful thing. And uh, he were, you were doing better when you weren't commenting, Larry. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, I, I don't know if there is, a, like, a definitive list. like, But but it, it should be a bit disconcerting, possibly disconcerting. That uh, 
you have you have very well to do folks uh washington security people who know where the dead bodies are that they're buying this type of property now that might you can't really tell from that either because that might just be a reflection who are the types of people to pursue these times of these these types of uh bloodthirsty jobs that these folks have they're probably paranoid by nature right yeah probably so I don't or, know. or maybe or maybe they like the idea of going out and playing weekend warrior and saying, I'm getting away. I'm going to go out to the wilderness. Yeah, it could be that. So I'm, I'm not sure that they are the gilded uh, canary in the coal mine, but they brought they probably have some brand new flannel shirts still in the wrapper in their go samsonite and they're, they're probably just waiting for the opportunity to use it they're going to put on that they're going to put on that uh that flannel shirt and say look at me i'm a lumberjacking guy i will say this i i we, we don't have a specific i don't you don't so when i say we i mean lou and i talking here right now i don't mean some royal or corporal corporate we uh we don't have any specific you know, watch for this, and then maybe you want to think about uh, heading to a homesteading alternative. But I will say it probably is a good idea for you to have, like, some notion of the potential places where you would go and maybe work out a plan and even maybe visit some of these places and kind of get used to the routes. And I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. Now, before we went into this topic, I was hoping that you were going to talk about the self-reliance because I saw that listed in there. Which one is the self-reliance? Uh, I, I, I can swear on the show notes that part of I Ponder was going to be about the need for self-reliance or the benefits of oh, it, something like oh, that. Oh, you want to get to that? Let's yeah. do that. Okay, that is – where is it here? This is the case for teaching self-reliance to kids. Yes, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that was my plan. That's right. So we were going to talk about what are the signs, and then once you thought about the signs, then we were going to do, okay, here's some pl potential places to go to. But if you go to those places, you have to be self-reliant. So mm -hmm. are you self-reliant? Are your kids self-reliant? So, Yeah, in, in many, in many ways I am. Uh, this is one of the things that Scott and I were talking about last week came in, came up for dinner, is I mean the... Bowers. the yeah, the Bowers. The, the Bowers. Bowers. Is it the right. Bowers or the Bowers? But anyway, uh, when Bowers uh, came up here, we were talking about being self-sufficient and being more in touch with reality. Uh, people today are very disconnected from their food source, meaning where their food comes. They, they don't understand growing a garden, uh, working their garden, and they don't understand about raising animals or going out and hunting or just they, they think that the starting point of food is the grocery store. Uh, interesting story. My cousin was up here with his kids. This is many, many, many years ago, long before I lived up here. And we were all on a vacation together. And I think I was maybe, oh, gosh, 21, 22 at the time, something like that. And he and his kids were, were up here, and my mother tried to get them to eat some uh, wild raspberries. And the kids were like, no, no, you're trying to poison us. Ah, you're <laughs> killing us. And, and she's like, you know, what's wrong? These are raspberries. You've seen raspberries before, right? And, and the, the little girl says, raspberries come from the store, not the woods. Oh, that's, that hurts. Yeah. So when, when you're looking at that disconnection and the, the, that ignorance and lack of understanding for where, where food comes from, which is, 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 is something that's really basic and vital for, for human existence, everybody's got to eat and to not have any understanding about it. But if you look at uh, just being able to do things for yourself. Uh, the, I, I told the story not too long ago about having to do the first break job in many, many, many years. It's been so long since I've done a break job, I had to go to YouTube. But I was able to go to YouTube and find out exactly what I needed to have as far as tools and, and parts and everything else. And the, the, 
the uh, stewardship quoted me nine hundred thirty four dollars for the brake job. I, I bet I did it for two fifty or less. When I was in my early twenties, I'm not a mechanic, but when I was in my early twenties, I can't remember what the terms are. Was, like, was it a brake shoe or something that broke inside my brake disc? So my car was literally making a <laughs> sound. Okay, sounds like the pads. Yeah, the pads. So I took it apart. I just figured out, like just intuitively figured out, took it apart. I took the broken part to the store, uh, to the auto place, and uh, I asked them, what is this? <laughs> and they gave me a new this, which is like 30 40 bucks, I think. And I figured out how to put it on, and I fixed my brake. Bada boom, bada bing, Bob's your uncle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, so so Harder, when, though, when with it comes these electronic, newfangled electronic cars. Yeah. Well, and here's one for you. There, there's a commercial out, and I can't remember what the commercial is for, but anyway, uh, th this kid gets a flat tire, and he's talking to his dad on the cell phone, and, and the dad's like, "Well, you're gonna have to get the lug the lug wrench and and take the tire off," and and he says. To his uh, other kid friend, he says, is this a lug wrench? And the other kid's like, maybe. <laughs> I, so I, th this is just basic stuff, which back in the back in the 80s was considered adulting. Even as a teenager, you knew how to change a tire. You knew how to change an air filter in a vehicle. Uh, doing a brake job wasn't wasn't something that uh, you necessarily went to the went to the auto shop for. You know, most people most people did a lot of these things on their own, and and going back further in time, it was the same thing. When you look at the prices, I the, the fact that I saved six hundred fifty bucks, maybe seven hundred bucks on doing this job myself, I that that's a big effing deal, as Joe Biden would say. And when it comes to doing when it comes to doing a lot of these different home repairs, so Mar Martha knows what I'm talking about with that commercial, but the. I and mean, when it comes to doing home repairs and being able to take care of the stuff, I mean, if if you're wealthy and you got the money to pay people to do all this stuff, great, more power to you. But if it does become a bug out situation, and you you can't just call up the handyman, then how's this going to happen? If how are you going to do this stuff yourself if you fall in a situation where you need to? Yeah, and I, I'm not talking about a bug out situation though. I'm talking about. You know what? I see things going a certain way. It's time for me to work towards setting up a homestead. But if you're going to set up a homestead, your family has to have the skills to be self-reliant because a homestead, it's you're going to have to take care of yourself more. You're going to have to fix your own car and grow your own food and stuff like that. You're not going to be able to go down to Walmart because it's 15 minutes away because Walmart might be three hours or more away. If you're going to set, set up a, a homesteading situation. And in this article, uh, let me go back to it. So this is from the site here. What's the name of this site? This site is Survival Sullivan. Survival Sullivan. Creating a homeschool curriculum that suits both the academic. So they're talking about for people who homeschool. But even if you don't homeschool, you can... It, it's it's harder, but you can you can still get this in. Uh, uh, that suits both the academic and self reliance goals of a prepping family. It's an exciting ende endeavor. If you thought setting up the homeschool classroom was fun, the thrill of designing the curriculum is going to knock you. This thrill, or the thrill of designing this curriculum, is is going to knock your socks off. So basically, what they're talking about is creating a curriculum for your kids that teaches your kids to do basic basic things like how to grow food how to, to you know even if you know maybe not fix a car but at least take care of the basics with a car you know change the fluids and what have you and you know how to start a fire how to use guns that would be that would be one of the big things but you're gonna need guns if you're out in the middle of nowhere yeah or or I mean, for just not even not even crisis situation how to hang a door in a house right yeah. Yeah. Basic, basic maintenance things, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't do this with my daughter, but yeah, it's something that, yeah, I'm looking at this and I'm like, Paul, why aren't you doing these things? Dude, you got to do these things. I do some or, little things with her, but not, not to the extent that they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. or, or here's something else. Uh, this past weekend, I, I put in a, a dimmer switch. 
on uh, my living room lights. I'd never really messed with electrical stuff before. Uh, I, I bought a dimmer switch. I looked at the instructions. I talked to a couple people, and I put it in, and the house hasn't burned down yet. Martha, there should be a class in school that teaches the basics. If you mean government schools, there shouldn't be government schools. Uh, now, I, it should be the parents, the families. I, and I understand some kids don't have that support, but but you, Martha, you definitely have the skills and the abilities to teach it kids used, that. Yeah, those used to be called shop class and home economics. Right. Yeah, they used to teach more basics than, than they do now. But uh, it's not really in their best interest to teach kids to be self-reliant and self-sustaining. They want kids to have to to rely on purchasing products and services from large-scale systems that are fully in bed with the state. Did that sound paranoid? A little bit. Yeah, you know, something that's nice on, though. Uh, something that's nice about Home Depot is I think just about every Saturday morning, at least up here, uh, they have classes on how to do all these different things because Home Depot, their whole thing is selling selling stuff to people so that they can do it themselves. I granted, yeah, they'll supply contractors and everything, but the I think the I think the bulk of their business is homeowners and, and people that are going out and, and doing their own projects. So it, it it's actually beneficial to them to put on these things. It brings people in. It if if somebody if, if there if there's a, a demonstration on how to lay bathroom tile, if somebody's been considering this, if they can go in there, learn how to do it, and then, you know, af, af, after doing it, seeing it done, and maybe getting a chance to put a couple of tiles down themselves, they can go over it and purchase uh, a couple boxes of tiles and the caulk and everything that goes along with it. That, that's a good business strategy. But then they have to go get their licenses. I don't think you need a license to do it yourself. Oh. Oh, never mind. When you said business strategy, I was thinking because then you could, you know, you could do this for others. Okay, if you learn the skill, you could do it for others. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> because we live in the world where we live in, you, 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 there was a time when you actually could just learn those basic skills and then go out and say, "Hey, I could do this for you," but you can't just do that now because you have to go get them licenses and, instead of just references from people, which should you don't be good enough you have to go out and get licenses because if you if you don't have to get licenses then the people who have licenses uh they're they're, they're going to turn you in they're not going to be happy kind of like the union guys in the, in the philly soda story <laughs> you're like hey they're getting away with it you know rather than like asking yourself why are you putting up with it <laughs> they want to target the person who's quote unquote getting away with it with that i, th I think i think we're at the end of the show what do you say Okay, I think we've reached it. Do you have Do you have more to say? No, I I think I think we did a nice little overview, and and the listeners can infer whatever they want after that. Just all you people out there that are watching and listening, just make up the rest of the show on your own. If if you <laughs> if you feel if you feel there's something that's missing, go ahead and just add it in yourself. Or blame Paul. <laughs> or or blame Paul or Larry or La no yeah Larry Larry yeah just everybody everybody you say. Thanks, Larry. No, I think I think I think we got the basics covered. It's uh, there's 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 really no sure way to know whether it's time to homestead or not. If you're going to homestead, have a good idea it, of where it's to always go. time to homestead. The the question is, when's it time to bug out? The bugging out question is another matter altogether. Mm -hmm. That is like things are more urgent. You don't have time. I would say this, that if you're not, I don't want to sound paranoid because you could go your whole life and never have to worry about a bug out situation, but it's better to be prepared and never have to use something than to not be prepared and have to use it. So, you know, what what we're hinting at here, we're talking about, are your children prepared? Are you prepared? Or is your, is your, if you're married, if your spouse is prepared, is your family ready to do what has to be done to go into a bug out situation and yeah just like homesteading bug out situations are going to require you to be highly self-reliant and uh i'm gonna say uh what's the word i'm looking for I mean, you're gonna have to be a good handyman <laughs> you got to be able to fix stuff and take care of things and keep things going build 
build things. Can you yeah. build a chicken coop? How would you build it? What would it look like? Yeah, these are the things. And uh, I've talked with uh, uh, Professor Rambo. One of the things, if, if, if you're networking with people and you guys are already talking about how you know we'll work as a group, then you don't have to learn everything. You can network with people that have different types of skill sets, so you know that so and so is going to have this handled. Like, whatever you know, you have to have. Well, I don't want to say you have to have, but it's really advantageous. Have a gunsmith in your group, for instance. That's a good thing. Have mm -hmm. uh, elect, you know, somebody who knows elect, uh, electronics well. Somebody who, you know, they don't have to be a doctor, but they hate, that they know medicine and you know if. If you're going to rely on herbal medicines, which a lot of it you probably would, then having somebody like that, yeah. So the yeah, somebody who can somebody too. who can grow grow and roll herb. Yeah, <laughs> gotta roll them herbs. We're talking for medicinal purposes only, though, because we're a family show. Are we a family show? Okay. Are we? Yes, I I like to think so. You're far away from your mic. I can't hear you well. You lean. I said. I said. There, I like to think that. So I like to think that's a family show. Yeah, we try to make it a family show. That way, you can have your kids watch, and everybody can watch, and everybody can, you know, learn my freedoms and my liberties. You know, I didn't change the scene to to the uh, off the leash scene, and I feel bad about that. I kept us on the longer leash scene. There you go. There it is. Uh, so for the last three minutes, whatever other show. There you go. It's got the beautiful mountains behind it, and that's that's the off the leash, folks. That's so the part the, where you. What we need is what we need is something really good for I ponder. We need an I ponder graphic. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, shoot me some ideas. We'll come up with some. Okay. Because the, the show's got to be tight. It's got to be visually and audibly and otherwise tight. Because Lou will do nothing other than tight, right? I like it tight. No loose and sloppy. Right. And and I just want to say, Lou, if you could uh, just uh, get me a picture of you as a young man on them hockey ice skates. I really want to see that picture. I don't think that any of those pictures exist anymore. Well, that's a terrible thing. That is a tragedy. That is a loss to humanity that we will never, ever fully recover from. So on that note, I want to thank everybody who joined us, who watched the show. I especially want to thank the people who commented because the comments are like little pieces of crack that I smoke. And that's a good thing. Not that I smoke real crack today. It's like catnip. Right. It's like catnip. Uh, uh, I'll say a couple things. Uh, no shows tomorrow. So there's no headlines you may have missed tomorrow. There's no his dailies tomorrow. His Daily Monday will be on this Monday with uh, Professor Rambo and myself. I don't know what our topic will be just yet. And, of course, Monday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on my personal Facebook page is uh, Headlines You May Have Missed. And, Lou, I know you never miss those shows, right? Uh, I catch a lot more of them than you, would, than you would believe. That sounds heartwarming. I feel good about that. I'm going to hug myself now. Okay. Good. Go on yourself. Any, do you have any? Do you have any uh, last, last, last uh, closing remarks, words of encouragement, or doom? Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. We do. We hope your time. We hope you feel that your time was well spent. Yes, we hope you feel that your your time was well spent. And with that, I'll if, say, if not, you'll get your money back. <laughs> right. Uh, see Lou. See Lou about that. Oh, oh, we got a couple of comments that I missed here. I'll address those real quick here. So Jacob says, damn it, Larry. I don't know why. Uh, Larry says, you're not bugging out. Stop with the bugging out fantasy. And Jacob says, weed smiths. And then, uh, and then Jacob says, damn it, Paul. I guess he's an equal opportunity dammer. That's good. And uh, Martha says, great show, guys. Thank you, Martha. La Makina. And uh, Jacob says, peace, gentlemen. Yes, we are peace, gentlemen. That's exactly who we are. You figured us out. You know too much now. And with that, I'll say good night, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. You know what I'm going to do? What my daughter does. She does this on some of her sign-offs. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great rest of your week. Have a great rest of your month. 
Have a great rest of your year and have a great rest of your life. Good night, everybody.